Thank you for listening to the history of the papacy. I am your host, Steve, and I want to quickly mention that I have officially relaunched the Beyond the Big Screen podcast. We have all new guests, all new topics. It's going to be really awesome. And if you want to learn more, you can go to beyondthebigscreen.com and you'll be able to. And if you go to your favorite podcatcher of choice, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, you'll be able to subscribe there. And I would definitely appreciate you leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts for the History of the Papacy and Beyond the Big Screen, because it'll really help more people learn about both shows. I'd like to quickly just mention that you can join us on Patreon. There's four great levels. You can go to patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy to learn more about each of those. But before we go too far, let me thank our Patreons on patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. We have Roberto, Joran, William, Brian, Jeffrey, Christina, and John at the Alexandria level. We have Doppel, Paul, Justin, and Lana, who are all magnificent at Constantinople. And reaching that highest level of prestige, that of the Sea of Rome, we have Peter the Great. And I'd also like to welcome a brand new Patreon at the Antioch level, Sean. So, Sean, thank you very much for joining us. And if anybody else, a great way to support the show is through Patreon. So in today's episode, Gary and I, we of the History of the Bible podcast, Gary Stevens, we've wrapped up our section of the 12 Minor Prophets. And today in pure YouTube and um, all sorts of video styles, we're going to rank them from 12 to 1, who our favorites are. We have a little bit of disagreement. We hash those disagreements out, and you're going to see who we think are the top 12. And then in future episodes, we're going to talk to some other people on their top 12s and why they think each uh, and what they think about each one of those prophets. So today you'll get a little taste of what Gary and I think of our top 12 and true internet ranking style. Then this is a great time to send in your questions and comments as well. And maybe you think that somebody, one of these prophets should be at a different place, but we'd love to hear. So I just want to thank everybody for listening and we will talk to you next time. All right, here we go. Welcome back to the final, the 12 episode, or maybe the final. Let's not count the 12 out yet. But here we are again. I'm Steve, History of the Papacy podcast. As you well know, we are also joined by Gary of the History in the Bible podcast. And we've been dissecting and putting back together the 12 minor prophets of the Old Testament. Today is our chance where we get to rank the 12 minor prophets from our favorites, our, our mediums, and our not-so-favorites. Mm, not-so-favorites. Mm. So maybe, Gary, maybe just in the, the, I mean, people at this point, I if you you've probably listened to all of them before, but maybe you're joining in at this point and you're you just want to see a wrap up of the 12 prophets who are these 12 minor prophets the 12 minor prophets are a collection of people and they're called the 12 because there's 12 of them and they're all very short books which as far as we know all ended up written on a single scroll so if you put all the 12 together they're about the size of one of the big prophets like isaiah or Jeremiah, or Ezekiel. We have no idea how the selection came to be. Sometimes we only have the vaguest idea of when these people lived. In other cases, some of the prophets are actually very specific. They'll give you the year they are writing in. Most of the, the prophets seem to be responding to a particular crisis, such as the Assyrian invasion of Israel, or the Babylonian threat to Judah. Uh, or the, um, the exile and the return. 
The prophets vary widely in their uh, subject matter, their, well, sanity, whether they make sense or not. Um, Now, one thing I, I should mention is that word prophet. I think the word prophet is a terrible translation uh, in English. In Hebrew, the word that's used to describe them is navi, and that means someone who is called or who announces. So the original meaning in Hebrew is more like a man from God. It, it's more like John the Baptist. Okay, So John the Baptist isn't full of prophecies. And it's, this is mainly the case with the Twelve. Very few of them actually make any prophecies at all. But in fact, they are, they are just giving God's word to the people. And of course, it's not a great word. Now, prophets were all over the place in the ancient Middle East. And the Bible, in fact, mentions a lot of what they call men of God. And court prophets were people who attended the local ruler. And uh, like the Hebrew prophets, they deliver the words of the gods to the rulers. And often the words are something like, hmm, Marduk needs a new room on his temple. Absolutely. We'll get that done tomorrow. So they're they're fairly self-serving. In general, from what we can gather, they tend to be yes-men, reassuring the local ruler. So they're not exactly priests. They have have a different function. They're, They're more secular. And they work in the community. And the Hebrew prophets are pretty much like them. Although, as it turned out, the Hebrew prophets became much more central to um, Israelite and Judean society than the Mesopotamian prophets. Anyway, that's, that's, that's the intro to the prophets, I think. Does that do? So the, and the, it really seems these prophets are con- entirely different than a prophet like um, the Oracle of Delphi who's kind of getting what the gods say, thinking about it, and giving you something that maybe will happen in the future or some bizarre interpretation. These guys, the 12 minor prophets, they're in it, the prophets in general in the Old Testament, they're getting the straight scoop from upstairs and telling it to the people. Because kind of if you think about it like theologically, according to the, the Old Testament, if God's omnipotent and he can see the past, see the future, see the present, then whatever he's saying has to be the straight scoop. There's no interpretive or through this minor prophets, they're saying what they've, unless they're not interpreting it correctly. And then why would they put it in this book? Uh, yeah, now, as I said, we have no idea how they came to be chosen. And as you'll find out soon, we think that some of them maybe, maybe there were better candidates out there. We have no idea how many prophets actually wrote books. There could be dozens of these things which simply just never got included in the the Old Testament. Uh, And also one thing, a lot of the, the prophets are social critics. They... Well, actually, they fall into different groups. Some of the, the prophets, the Hebrew prophets, are critics of the government and critics of government policy, particularly foreign policy. And some of the uh, minor prophets are social critics who are indirectly criticising the government, but they criticise the government not for its foreign policy, but for the social ills that it is, it is allowing to be perpetuated. I think the 12 minor prophets, that's a really interesting point that you bring up, is that with with the 12 minor prophets, they really do seem to have this connection to Christianity. And I think that I started to understand more about that early Christianity is really pulling something different out of the Old Testament that, you know, like if you follow like the Christ myth theory and that it's all basically they made it up, slapped on some Greco-Roman religion and here we go. But you can really see that throughout the New Testament that they're reaching into a very specific strain of things that were going on in the Old Testament. And they really seem to like the 12 minor prophets and Daniel in particular. 
And now it's time to get into the, the heart of the story here, if you will. We're going to talk about who our favorites and who our least favorites are. So of with any great uh, t- top, well, top 12 in our case, we're going to stop start at our least favorite. And mostly Gary came up with several highly subjective m- measures of readability and readability, intelligibility, affability, bonkerosity, <laughs> relevance to our times, length, resonance of themes in common with other prophets, and use of exotic symbolism. So those were really the, that was the rubric we used to judge these prophets. So let's start off with our bottom four. And Gary... Let's uh, let's just maybe name your who are your bottom four as far as the twelve prophets go. Okay, Steve. Now my bottom four: uh, Haggai, Joel, Zechariah, and Hosea. And let's briefly recap them. Haggai and Zechariah are exact contemporaries because they they specifically date themselves, and they are dated to. Shortly after the return, and they are exhortations to the people of Israel to rebuild the temple. That's all they're on about. Their theme is, we got to rebuild the temple, guys. We're back in the homeland, but we ain't got no temple. Let's rebuild it. And Haggai and Zechariah refer to the two most important politicians of the day, the high priest Joshua and the obscure Zerubbabel, if that's how he's pronounced. And they are preoccupied with these two people. Zerubbabel's a bit weird because Haggai and Zechariah are both big boosters of Zechariah, oh, sorry, of Zerubbabel, who seems to have been well, the, the political leader. And they're predicting a great future for Zerubbabel. But Zerubbabel just disappears. Poof! In the narrative. So these predictions of future didn't happen too much. So I'm putting Haggai and Zechariah... <clears throat> into my bottom four, because they're talking about a very specific political situation in a very short window of time. And to me, it's like, they're just not, they're not relevant to the day. They're not that interesting. Now, I think you have them in your bottom four, don't you? So definitely Zechariah and Haggai made it to my bottom of the list. And it's really for the same reasons that you said is that it's a, a, a Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel, if you prefer. It, it really, it was, it seemed very specific to the time, and then they overlapped each other so much. It's like it, it just didn't really stick with me. I think the only thing that gives Zechariah an honorable mention is that he has a couple of really interesting scenes in there, and I know we quoted these in other episodes, but there's the clean garments of the high priest where. Satan and God are judging the high priest Joshua, and it's the scene just comes out of absolutely nowhere. And then um, the flying scroll of the gigantic flying scroll, which I thought that that gave that might almost bumped Zechariah into middling status, but it still kept him in the bottom for me. Yeah, I'm just not impressed with either of them. I mean, it's like they're talking about some obscure politician who was famous for about six months, several hundred years ago. And I don't yeah, really... It, just no relevance, no... <clears throat> it, it just absorbed in minutia of the day-to-day in the temple. And in the end, it just didn't... Yeah. <laughs> almost like, who cares? I think that's what really, really sunk those two to the bottom. And the fact that they were so similar... Yeah, had to put them in the bottom. Uh, now, my next two uh, differ from Steve's next two. Uh, amongst my bottom four, there is Joel. Joel is, I think, the only minor prophet that we have absolutely no idea when he lived. There, there's no internal clues. He refers to no sort of politics. We just don't know. And I don't like Joel because, well, he's, 
He's a proto-apocalypse. It's full of fairly surreal imagery. Uh, locusts and droughts and the end of times are coming, which may be an indicator he's a fairly late writer. Um, but I'm not a huge fan of the apocalypses. I find them too raving mad myself. And Joel is, it's not a full-blown apocalypse like Revelation, which is, you know, completely over the top. I just find his imagery sort of, uh, it's ugly, it's depressing, it's slightly mad. Uh, so that's that's my, my third of the fourth. And the other one that I put in is also Hosea. I just can't stand the man. But we'll get into that later. So uh, what are your other members at the bottom for? All right, so my two bottoms of the bottom, of my bottom four are Nahum and Obadiah. Now Obadiah, he had he's the shortest book in the entire Bible, New Testament or Old, and it's a short, maybe paragraph, two paragraphs of just pot shots at Edom. Yeah, <laughs> who cares about Edom? A tiny, tiny, tiny principality at the very bottom of the um, of Israel. It just to to take such a minor little player, and you basically have a very short rant against them, and then you move on to the next. I just I don't understand why Obadiah is there. It's too short. I don't see the point in taking these pot shots at Edom. I mean, Edom was just trying to survive like the next guy. It it just to me it could have been cut out, cut out, and we would have been fine without Obadiah. Yeah, I mean, Obadiah is just it's just a nasty little rant against um, a bunch of people he doesn't like, isn't it? it, it you know. Um... I, I rated him a bit higher, but, but yeah, Obadiah, yeah, I'll give you that. He could, he could easily be in my bottom four. And then my second, or my my second divergence at least, and he he ranked high. He was almost, Nahum was almost in the middling car- category. It's just that um, Nahum wasn't very exciting. The plus you could give is his was the first, if I'm not mistaken, that was outside of Israel. He talked a lot about Nineveh, but it was just a, it, to me, it was kind of, Nahum was disjointed from the whole rest of the 12, and he just didn't seem to fit in. And that's why I, I threw him to the bottom. I can, I can understand that. Yeah. Nahum is basically just a rant, a gloat about the fall of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. So it was obviously written shortly after that event. It's got nothing to do with the ancient Israelites. It's not really talking about God. It's just sort of snidely whiplash, twirling his moustaches, um, walking over the bones of his defeated enemies. It's not, it's not uplifting, is it? So now here we come to the tricky part. So mm. it seems like we might be able to come to a compromise with Obadiah. Mm. And so our difference is Nahum, Joel, and Hosea. Yeah. Who do you, are you willing, are, is there one of them that you you might have to drag your feet on to keep in the bottom? Oh, oh I absolutely want Hosea at the bottom. I know we disagree about this. No, I cannot stand Hosea. I will not remove him out of the bottom four. I, I, might, I, might, I might let Joel go because he's sort of harmless. Let's talk a little bit about Hosea because Hosea is, he is a tricky prophet, that one. Hosea is our first prophet of either um, any list you go by, the Septuagint list or the Masoretic text list. He's the first and he starts off with a bang. The short story on Hosea is that he is a minor prophet, of course. But he, God basically tells him to marry a harlot, and it it goes downhill from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, That's the high point. Yeah. And the whole story is basically that Israel is the harlot, and... 
uh, besides that meta that metaphor or analogy that they're making between Israel and the harlot, they really run down Hosea's wife Gomer and their children. So I'm thinking that that's where your disagreement with Hosea yes. comes from. And now a word from our sponsors. Uh, and and the names of his children. It's, it's something like. Um... The Hebrew words translate as something like, I hate you, um, and you bastard, or, or, you know, something like that. And they're just, I just, I don't like the imagery. Okay, I, I can see he's, 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 God is trying to make a point, because God is a jealous God, about Israel's harlotry, but I don't like the way it's done. I don't like the, the inherent misogyny in it, the, the, yeah, I actually looked up the other day. How many times are prostitutes referred to in the Old Testament? It's about a hundred times. Doesn't that seem a lot for a holy book? A little, little bit of preoccupation going on here. No, I just don't like that aspect of it. But so yeah, I just don't like Jose. It's really interesting because they, if you, if you're coming into the reading the book blind and you don't have any context for it, it sure does seem from that first section that it's not metaphorical. No. No, and then you him. read on and you can see, okay, yeah, that's probably a metaphor, but they never do really spell out that it is a metaphor, that Gomer and that this, these names that they give for the kids are metaphorical. I could see putting Hosea towards the bottom just for that point alone, mm -hmm. that they never really do. It's never spelled out that, okay, you know that this is what we were doing it, you kind of have to read behind between the lines to backdate that these that that first whole initial couple of, at least a chapter is just an analogy for israel but you have to admit if you were the least literally minded about reading the bible you'd take it literally wouldn't you yeah you yeah for sure so that's the bottom four covered isn't it so if we, uh, I did a little consolidation here of our bottom four oh, okay. in no particular order, Hosea. Well, I, I guess we could say pretty safely our two individual bottom fours are Obadiah and Hosea. Yeah. And then we both agree Haggai and Zechariah. Not terrible, yep. just not great. Yeah. And I'm willing to put Obadiah in the, in the very bottom four because I've got him in number eight at the minute. So... So our consolidated bottom four, starting at 12, Hosea with a close Obadiah, Zechariah, Haggai, and yeah. Zechariah and Haggai probably interchangeable at this yeah. point. Okay, that's cool. That's our bottom four. And let's go to our middling prophets. These were the prophets we did not have strong opinions of one way or the other. So maybe I will start with my middle group. And for my middle group, so now Hosea's got cut from my middle group, but I have Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Malachi. And really in no particular order, I I did rank Hosea a little bit higher, but since uh, uh, Gary convinced me to throw him to the bottom... So my basic reasons, Hosea, I I had him as a middling, but I was able to be convinced to put him to the bottom as he's really, um, his language was problematic in the new, in how we speak today. It was, if it was purely a metaphor or analogy, it just didn't come off well. Habakkuk has a great ship named after him, but the book of Habakkuk wasn't mem memorable to me. Although it was very influential on Christianity, so the book definitely had some staying power. Zephaniah, some say that maybe there was a USS Zephaniah at one point, <laughs> but um, as far as uh, as a book, it was it had some influence with some, the later tradition, but just not a particularly memorable book. And my last middling book was Malachi. 
it was the last book of the Old Testament. And um, in the next book, if you have a uh, New Testament, Old Testament, you know, a, a Christian Bible, if you will, that it goes, jumps right to Matthew. And my issue with Malachi is there's really no transition to the New Testament. And I, I think that there is something that seems like it's missing. And uh, Gary will have uh, something to say about that that there maybe was a transition from between Malachi and the New Testament. So Malachi was traditionally held to be the last minor prophet and the last written book in the Old Testament. That cannot possibly be right. We're not really sure, I suppose, about the poetic books, you know, about whether bits of Psalms are written at this time or that time, or Lamentations, etc., but a good candidate for the last written book of the Old Testament is, of course, Daniel, because it has a whole collection of prophecies which clearly refer to the Hellenistic kings and would have to have been, at least those parts of Daniel, had to have been written at least a good century after Malachi. Now, if Daniel is really the last written book of the Old Testament, it forms a sort of a transition to the New Testament because Daniel, the second half of Daniel, is is a full is a full on mini apocalypse, full of surreal imagery, uh, prophecies of the future or supposed prophecies of the future, and very much res- resembles Revelation in a lot of way. So if we accept Daniel as the last book, then that would that would form a suitable end to the Old Testament. But of course, in tradition, you cannot accept Daniel as the last written book because the first half of Daniel says it's written by a guy who lived during the Babylonian exile, when manifestly it was not written by such a person. Wait, and so, oh, the one thing with Malachi is it's written in the 500-ish, and it just seems strange that there's nothing written, that there would be nothing written between 500 and, say, 500 BCE and 50s, 60s-ish uh, CE. Well, there was. There was buckets of it. But, but not canonically. A, yeah, non-canonically. The, the, um, uh, the, it's now called the parabiblical literature. And I have got two volumes of it, and it's a, there's about 3,000 densely packed pages of it. it. There were dozens of these things, which were, of course, some of them were uncovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of them were used by the Ethiopian uh, Jews and the Ethiopian Orthodox Christians. But not one single one of these documents made it into the official Old Testament. Not one of them. If you'd actually put all the, this literature that we have into the Old Testament, you would easily triple its length, the, the length of the entire Old Testament. But for some reason, someone said, okay, Malachi, right, that's a neat way we'll tie him off with Malachi and we'll forget everything that's written afterwards. Uh, yeah, so Steve and I agree about Malachi and Zephaniah in the middling middle. I also included Obadiah in the middle, but I'm happy to drop him to the bottom list. And I also included in the middle Nahum, who you put into, you put into the bottom list, didn't you? Yeah, he uh, sunk to the bottom. Yeah. I put him in the middle. Well, there's only so many people you can put at the bottom. I, I put Nahum into the middle, even though it's just a gloating description of Assyria. But I'm happy to... I mean, all these guys in the middle, you can shuffle them around, can't you? Nahum rises to the middle. Nahum. Okay, Nahum rises to... Just barely. Oh, Hosea sinks to the bottom. Blah, 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 blah. Now, um, Habuk, Habakkuk was in was one of my middlings. Oh, okay. I I put Habakkuk at number four, so he just barely. So we'll have a jo- um. Th- well, maybe we shouldn't say it. Oh, forget I said that, ja. But um, we'll have a little controversy. So we'll we're gonna put Habakkuk in the penalty box right now. And then we will get to him and see if he really does have a rightful place at the in the top four. Mm. Okay. And speaking of the top four, let's get to the top four, 
the top oh. four, and then that, I think that'll be able to settle out our middle. Yeah. Okay. So now we've we've got the the middle. The middles we is still a little shaky, but let's take a look at our top four now. Gary, who were your top four? My top four, and I'll actually list them in order: uh, Jonah, Amos, Micah, and Habakkuk. I really love Jonah. Jonah is affable fun time. Jonah is the only funny book in the entire Bible, Old and New Testaments. You all know the story of the fish. It's not about the fish. If you've only read the fish, you haven't read Jonah. Jonah, the poor bugger, is commanded by God to go to the capital city of Assyria, Nineveh, tell the Assyrians they've got it wrong and they should all convert to God. Naturally, Jonah runs in the exact opposite direction. He does not want to go to Assyria. No one wants to go to Assyria voluntarily. The Assyrians were famous for being, what is it, wolves on the fold sort of thing. But in the end, he ends up in Nineveh. And to his utter surprise, he converts everyone in Assyria to the God of Israel. He is the most successful prophet in the past 4,000 years. He completely, he does everything. And in a little twist at the ending, Jonah is incredibly depressed that it worked. So that's, <laughs> you're going, what? So the whole book is, is it, it's, I don't know, it's just affable and amiable and it's a little twist at the end. Second one for me, Amos. Amos is one of the earliest prophets, lived maybe a little bit after Hosea, uh, prophesies in the northern kingdom of Israel. Amos is really big about um, social and political life. He's not, he's not talking about religious stuff. He is concerned with uh, equity and social justice. And in fact, he attempts, he attacks empty piety. He hates people like the priests who walk around saying, literally, I am holier than thou. So I love Amos for that. Uh, Micah is, is another prophet I like because of his general themes of social justice. He speaks for the rural poor, and it's probable that he actually was, you know, uh, a rural person himself. Uh, Micah attacks the government and cities in general as corrupt institutions who oppress the poor. So here's my third one, and my fourth one is Habakkuk. Uh, because his theme, again, is a social justice thing, or no, it's a theological issue. He's, main, he's mainly about why does God not prevent injustice? So those are my top four. My top four were pretty close, and I should I don't think we said this. So we did these ratings independently, and I think it's interesting that our, uh, we're fairly close on these. I picked Jonah as number one. I think... Jonah's a story, and I think I can see why Jonah, except for that last little bit, is it makes it into every Sunday school class. He's um, especially that beginning section where he's on the boat. He decides, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going to the exact opposite direction. He doesn't paint the 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 side characters as jerks. They're honestly painted in a very nice way that they don't want to blame this all on Jonah, even though it is Jonah's fault. And then they finally do toss him overboard. But that's <laughs> kind of what Jonah's um, Jonah's in on that one. He's on board on it. The Big Fish is fun, which we talked about in the episode that it probably wasn't a whale. And I, I think that the author was, pro I think the author was having fun with the Big Fish. And then that ending. The ending is great. It's it's the best ending of all the 12, no, no doubt about it. Amos gets number two for me because it's just a rollicking narrative. It's just one thing after another, after another, after another. I also like his really detailed plan of almost genocide against the Philistines. I mean, he lays it out in complete, complete detail and he hates him some philistines 
And I just wonder, why are the Philistines so hated? You get the the biblical... I would love to, if they were to dig someplace and find a, a document of what the Philistines thought about the Israelites <laughs> and the Judeans. Because by all accounts, they have a pretty sophisticated culture. The Penta- what, is it the Pentapolis? Yeah, the, the, five the, cities, the Pentapolis. Or is it, they're really advanced cities with advanced technology, advanced systems. It seems a lot more advanced than what their their neighbors have going on. And is it jealousy of the Philistines, or are the is it a culture clash with the Philistines? Because the Philistines, from what I understand, they were probably some sort of Indo-European group oh, that yeah. became. Um, acculturated to the Canaanites yeah. so that they they had some Indo-European Greekish ideas that were mixed in with Canaanite language. Yeah, I think some people are saying they, are, they could be remnants of some of the sea peoples who are often taken to be Greeks and others sort of running around. I think one of the reasons that um, the Israelites, the southern kingdom, would have particularly hated the Philistines is that the Hebrews never managed to conquer them. I mean, if we go right back to David versus Goliath the Philistine, you get the impression that we whop those dudes who thoroughly deserved it. But in fact, Israel never touched Philistia. The cities, so I think it's a, it was a, they resi- the Israelites resented the fact they'd never managed to conquer the coastal Philistines. And because of that, the little southern kingdom of Ju- Judah never had a Mediterranean coast, unlike the kingdom of Israel to the north, which could um, transport things across you know, the Mediterranean coast. So I think it's just maybe sour grapes. Yeah, so that, so that's, the, that's my theory. The northern kingdom of, did have a, a little sliver of the Levant in between Lebanon. Yeah, fairly big chunk, actually. Yeah, they, ha- they had the coast. And to the north of them were the Phoenicians. That could be their gripe against Edom, too. Yes. Edom was the, uh, it connected those trade routes between Saudi Arabia points eastward yeah. and the Red Sea and Egypt. So that could be a, that could be a reason that they wouldn't be big fans of Edom either. That's true. I think the, the little kingdom of Judah was just resentful that it was such a puny, podunk little uh, kingdom surrounded by equally puny little kingdoms, and they just didn't like each other. So I talked about my thoughts. So it's Micah. He is interesting to me, and he made it into my top four because of that whole God suing Israel. I like that. Maybe God and Israel should have seeked some sort of arbitration. I also like the language that language in chapter six, verse fourteen. And oh, okay. So I, I really, I don't know why this particular verse stuck with me, but it's uh, ch- chapter chapter six, verse sixteen. You will eat but you will not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You will store up, but save nothing because what you save, I will give to the sword. You will plant, but not harvest. You will press olives, but not use the oil. You will crush grapes, but not drink the wine. And then there's some other stuff about Omri and Ahab and all these different things. But and, but it ends up with you will be the scorn of the nations. And that's a really powerful verse that you're going to do all these things, but you're not going to reap any of the benefits of them. And I thought that that was a really powerful part of Micah, where we kind of go we, our separate ways here is with, and he, he actually was my bottom one, is Joel. I liked the bit about Joel being a proto-apocalypse. I Okay. I, and I liked like his beat plowshares to swords and pruning oh. to spears, how he inverted that. It's funny. You never hear that quoted in church, do you? Beat your plowshares yeah. into swords. So he must have, so that must have been a common saying because we see mm. that in other, that the inversion of it, of mm. beating your plowshares into, or your swords to plowshares yeah. and your pruning hooks or your 
whatever whatever but so, so you see that you see that uh, it, at least two times in mm. the minor prophets and isn't it mm. again in a one of the hey, I'll, I'll grant you that i'll grant you that I'll, okay so I'm, I'm willing as we discussed before willing to float joel up a bit so we, we tend to agree with the with the top four and with the bottom four and the middle we're just not that excited about are we and now a word from our sponsors. I would love to bump. I wish that Habakkuk could get something special. He should get an. He should get a an honorable mention just for the the ship, even though the ship didn't have much to do with him in particular. But I think that that's that's great. How many how many of them besides probably Jonah? would really be a and Habakkuk the HMS Habakkuk isn't exactly a household name but it's pretty darn close to it if anybody who's a World War II history buff is probably going to have heard about that or read about that along the way and just to remind people the HMS Habakkuk was Winston Churchill and Jeffrey Pike's idea to create an artificial iceberg the inside the size of the entire American Navy at the time and use it as a floating aircraft, as an aircraft carrier. And it was somewhat over a million tons. Uh, just un- unbelievable. And it was made of ice with straw mm. Mm. frozen into it. Yeah. Awesome idea. I can't believe that that ice f- frozen into straw probably hasn't made its way into something else. Like maybe those, um, those uh, ice hotels that they make in Norway and oh. Sweden and up in Canada. Yeah. Maybe they... They fold that in somehow because it, it seems like they probably would crack. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They'd be very fragile. I wonder, yeah, those ice hotels. Do they do they throw in something fibrous into the um, into the ice? Although they seem fairly trans. Oh. I don't know how transparent is say you know a meter of ice. It's it's not that transparent, is it? No. Okay, so you could throw in anything and you wouldn't notice it. They t- mm. There's a way to make really clear ice. Mm. Like, um, I think they use them in cocktails. Okay. As like a novelty, or sometimes they'll make ice sculptures out of that. Mm-hmm. But it's a really laborious project. It's nothing that you'd make a hotel out of. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. I don't know. So maybe there is yeah. something. There has to be something. I mean, I we were talking about it earlier i can't stand the cold so i could not imagine staying in an ice hotel yeah but um to each his own i suppose on that one hey when you were making this ice with with wood mixture how would you get the wood stuff to stay in uniform suspension as opposed to either sinking to the bottom or floating to the top wow that's an interesting question because Jeffrey Pike, the inventor of it, actually made a lot of it. So it was real and not just uh, a complete fantasy. How would you do that? And I wonder how they made it, because he made a fairly substantial mm. mock-up of it. Mm. How would you freeze that much ice? Yeah. Particularly in the 1930s or early 40s. Yeah, I mean, you would have to have a, a monumental... Mm ice house i mean i don't know how ice is really made industrially today so i couldn't speak to that but um or or maybe you just go to canada and and just freeze it in situ set it out yeah Yeah. Uh, pour the water wait just wait for the weather to do it but that sawdust i mean that is a i guess uh, i think reading further into it that it had to be built on that scale Mm. Or else it just couldn't work. But then yeah. building it to that scale made it not work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was something like, if it was any smaller, it'd melt. Even though it had refrigeration plants inside it. Um, well, it's the greatest ship that never was. Yeah, it's a, a, that is a very fascinating little piece of history mm. that's snakes its way through to the 12 prophets yeah. 
so we let's uh, just to quickly review we have at our bottom consolidated bottom gary and steve's consolidated list of the 12 minor prophets in no particular order in the bottom haggai zechariah obadiah and hosea okay we both felt pretty strongly about Obadiah and Hosea, so I would say that they're definitely sinking towards the bottom okay. of the Pi Crete block. Yeah. <laughs> In the middle, we didn't have strong opinions one way or the other. Our middling four, Malachi, Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, who almost made it to the top, which it's interesting. I wonder if... I wonder if Pycrete floats. Pike Crete floats. It must float, or else it wouldn't. Um, yeah, it's got to float. It wouldn't be a ship if it was. Well, it's ice. Float. Ice and floats. The, yeah, and the sawdust and wood floats too. So maybe the yeah. wood actually made it more buoyant. Yeah. But actually, think thing is, think it's just a huge iceberg. Most of it's going to be underwater, isn't it? Jeffrey Pike, an interesting guy. Oh, I'm barking mad. Wasn't he? From the, <laughs> yeah, from the bits sure we've read was. about it. Woo! And then the fact that major players in Britain and the United States mm. actually listened to yeah. him to some degree. Yeah. Then our mm-hmm. top four, which in kind of order, Joel just makes it in. Mm. Just, just, he's elbowing Habakkuk, holding him. Holding him under the pie creek. <laughs> then you have Amos, Micah, who are kind of in the middle of the top, and then Jonah, who's head and shoulders yeah. above them all, standing on a gigantic floating pile of pike crete. <laughs> if we're going to carry our uh, metaphor all the way through, <laughs> we might as well be like the 12 and carry our metaphors through. Well, some of them, well, some of them carry their metaphors all the way through. We will. So that's our, well, and we've got these guys in the middle who, yeah, yeah. I don't think either of us can get enthused about any of them. And that's that, or maybe that's not that. Mm. We may have one more episode in the works for you. Keep your podcatchers turned on and updated and whatever they're supposed to do, because we could have a little bit more Send in your questions. We love to hear your questions. And we might just have a bonus, bonus of a bonus on the 12 Minor Prophets. Is it a surprise, Steve? And I think we'll, unless you have one more thing to say about them, I think we've we've wrapped, we've done our job. You do your job with sending in those questions. And we might even do our job just a little bit more on them. Uh, goodbye, people. Uh, you know what you should... I love that when you were ending them in toodles. Was it... Oh, toodles. Or toodle do you... To, toodles is old Australian, so common 50s, 60s for goodbye. So you got to end it with toodles. Okay. Toodles all. other ones yeah it's in one of the biggies but so for him to invert that i I liked that i thought that was a i thought that was nice style he could have come up with his own thing but he he decided to take that and run with it yeah yeah